My name is Madison Norton. I'm 24 years old. I've been sober this time since December 9th of 2018, but I've been in the rooms of recovery since I was 19. My so gosh, that's so young. My name is Wade Broadus, and I'm 61 years old. I've been in recovery now for about 30 years. Oh, I'm Michael my Ball. husband. I'm 37. I've 30 years. I've been in recovery uh, since January 1st, 2010, uh, but I've been sober now for six months. I like I'm this, though. Also. Because they're um, sober now. I've been in recovery probably about four or five years. Sharon Weber, 62 years old. I wow, they have such a crazy age range. In August. I'm Kelsey Could Rose. Could be anyone and I am at Sharon's any time. Daughter. I'm Kelsey Rose and I am Sharon's daughter. I actually didn't realize that my mom had a problem with drinking until a little bit later. My mom was room parent. She was chaperones on field trips. I mean, Function. talk about like super duper mom. My name is Matthew Bautista and I'm 22 years old. Now that I've been sober for three years, like man, I'm getting my life back. Drug, drugs, they take, they can take your whole life. I seen it too, cause my dad, you know, he was on that heroin for a long time, you know? And I was a kid coming home, seeing needles popping out of his arms and stuff. My drug of choice was meth. Oh, my, drug of, my drug of choice was marijuana, but it soon got replaced by acid and hashish. I remember getting a prescription for some back pain and... That's how it all starts. That was probably the first time I used and I didn't think anything of it, that addiction would, would, would come with it. I've always said I will never be a drug addict and here I am, I'm addicted. Yo, popping pills, man, that's a... Uh... You don't know you can get addicted to that, but you can get addicted to pills real quick. Opiates were really my get down. It just is that the most epidemic is crazy that right now. Being okay, like multiply that times a million. At the beginning, the first hit, man, you feel good, but then after a while, it wears out, and then, man, you start brainwashes you. Your family starts to recognize it. You're not functioning right. You start thinking different, and. The drug starts getting to you, next thing you know, you, you haven't slept for days, you wow. got bags on your eyes, you think people are after you, and it just, drug is a lie. Drug is a lie. At the beginning, it's fun. The first time I took a drink, I was 14 years old. My <gasps> best friend in high 14? school said, I've got some vodka and let's go up to the golf course where we grew up and let's have a drink and let's get drunk. See, but that's like so normal. Like for teenagers to do. Kids have parties all the time and there's drinking as young as like middle school. I took that first drink and I felt amazing. I really liked the way that it made me feel. The first time I started to use drugs, I was out with some of the friends at the. It's definitely the people you hang out it's with. It's always like peer pressure. It is. I rolled up a joint and smoked it in the back of the school. Later on, as I got around 19, cocaine came into my life. It was I always heard that marijuana was a gateway uh, was drug. The next thing in line for getting high, and cocaine is very addictive, and it led me down a path where I was uh, giving up all of my life just for that euphoric high. The first time I used. I was probably 18 or 19 years old. I was at a club in West Hollywood and I met some people who um, I thought were cool and they had ecstasy and I didn't know what Oh gosh. Was. Instantly I was just in love. I was gonna I was say in love. Struggling. I'm gay, I'm biracial, and I had a lot of sort of self-hate and so when I took that drug for the first time it turned all of that off. But that escalated quickly to cocaine and then to meth, and it was when I found Yeah, that. I feel like a lot of times I people are using really drugs to, to escape from come, insecurities. Come My family didn't know that I had this addiction because you don't smell it, you don't see it, you could pop a pill and nobody would know. Yep. I felt kind of alone in this little secret that I had, this little addiction. The first time I used drugs, I was 12. 12. I was like madly in love with at the time, invited me to hang out after school, and we walked through the park, and he proceeded to teach me how to smoke weed out of a ballpoint pen. When I started ballpoint getting into heavy pen. drugs, I was about 15. Same boy taught me how to smoke uh, Oxycontin. When I got high on opiates for the first time, I didn't have like any worries. I have no um, worries. I, I was in like, love. 
love. That's how they're selling it. Was there a moment I tried to quit? All the time, especially as the negative consequences started. This disease is so powerful, it hijacks your brain. Mm. I remember the it's first true. time I got dope sick from opiates. I was using so heavily. A lot of people are all day I decided now. I wanted to try and stop. I um, tried to detox myself with like alcohol and weed and benzos, but I found I couldn't stop using opiates. I was tore up from the floor up and I was living in the streets of Skid Row. Mm. Skid Row. And some kids with me told me to go into a program. I opened the book of the Bible and started reading it, and I stayed so. You gotta believe in something greater than yourself. That's what it is. Today. Some people need religion. I'm cutting hair right now, and I'm, I'm getting back enrolled into school. That's great. If I wouldn't Isn't that nice? took that path, I would've probably even owned my own barbershop right now. He Some still can. Some of the dangerous things that I got involved in was uh, ripping off drugs and Guns getting involved and fighting Spirals getting involved. out of control. Life gets involved. The most dangerous encounter I faced during my addiction was probably when I was sharing needles on Skid Row. I just start oh engaging my. in criminal behavior and do things I'm not proud of. I suck for heroin once. It didn't make me feel any type of way. I just wanted to get high. I just resigned to die. I, I didn't care. Sadly, I, dr I drank and drove all the time. I put myself, oh. my, my daughter. And put everyone in danger. In Los Angeles at risk by drinking and driving. Over the years, I've had 32 friends overdose and die or kill themselves um, as a result of their addiction. 32? One is too many. And came very close to ending my own life. I was living in a park in San Diego, homeless, and it was the middle of the night, and I was walking across a bridge, and I found myself standing on the edge of it, looking down, I think fully intending to jump. Oh my gosh. All these people had different points where they realized that they had a problem, they needed to reach out for help. But before that, it was never like, I'm not, I'm not gonna rely on anyone, and then you're standing on a bridge about to jump off. Obviously, I didn't jump. Um, Instead, what I did was I texted a friend back in LA, and I think probably for the first time in my entire life, I asked for help. There's always help. These people were able to get help, but oh, in a lot of cases, that doesn't happen. The turning point the first time um, I wanted help, I was just drinking and doing pills at the time. I was 19, and actually the same boy who introduced me to opiates and who oh taught me Oh my gosh, she needs to get away uh, from this guy. <laughs> her reason was always for a heroin. boy. He came to visit me and he had a year off heroin. That was the first time I like wanted to get better was so that like I could be in a relationship. The turning point was when I was sentenced for my fourth DUI. Four. Wow. That was her turning point. It had to come it to- It should have been the first one. I lost everything that was meaningful to me in my life. My marriage, my daughters, my career, my home, and my freedom. Get around a, a mentor. Mentor somebody that's, that's willing and open. There's a way out. I'm here to encourage you. There's a way out. Be honest with yourself. Because for a long time, I told myself, no, I'm not addicted. I think it's so hard for people to ask for help because they're so embarrassed. Open up to somebody that you think could help and really get accountability. Pick up the phone, ask for help. Absolutely. You're going to be amazed what kind of life you can have. Keep your eyes forward, I think. For me, it was really dark for a really long time. And she had like no childhood. She's been doing it since she was 12. If you're struggling with addiction right now or somebody that you know is struggling with addiction, I want you to know that there's hope. It's your choice if you want to take the first step. Because that's hard. Like you can't really help anyone who doesn't want to help themselves. The entire world will conspire in your favor and meet you where you are. And you only have to do it one day at a time. Wow. I loved how everyone shared their story, and it was very like uplifting, and I feel like I could send that to a family member and be like, hey, watch this. We do have a family member that uh, that's currently uh, in some recovery of, of sorts, and uh, it's been devastating for our whole family. Their family members are impacted just as much as someone who's addicted. My younger brother, now he's about, to, he's turned 40, in fact, in prison. Basically, he was a personal trainer, and he hurt himself, and it started slowly with back pain and you know terrible pain management. Over time, it became this just ramping up. You know, normal Advil doesn't work. Then Vicodin does nothing. Then now I'm into oxycodone, and now I'm into all these you know 
hardcore opioids. And so you see this opioid crisis going from doctor prescribed uh, medications to stuff right off the street. I just think it's great they've been sober for so long. That Absolutely. is not easy. Back in the day, I became addicted to Tylenol PM and it took me six months to get off of Tylenol PM. So I could not imagine how hard it is to get off what they got on. My dad, he always talks about like how his dad was on drugs and he would come home and see like his dad, you know, falling out on the floor and stuff like that. And he's like, just don't ever get involved in drugs because that's what it could do to you. So for this episode, we are partnering with Elks Drug Awareness Program and the DEA to help bring awareness to this really important issue. For those who don't know, Elks DAP is the nation's largest all volunteer drug education and prevention program that strives to teach kids and parents about the dangers of illegal drug use and prevent the misuse of alcohol and prescription drugs. We brought in teens and their parents to discuss drug abuse since it's not an individual issue as much as it is a family issue. But before we dive into questions, what would you want to say to the people in these videos if you had the opportunity to talk to them in person? One, thank you for sharing and, you know, being honest about how bad things can get before they get better. I'm glad they're still here and I'm glad that they made it out. Um, and I would wish them the best in their journey. I would honestly want to ask them how did they get to this sobriety like what was their first step so i could possibly help people i know that are going through the same thing well we have a rare opportunity today where you're actually going to be able to speak to some of these people who oh. have graciously given us their time to have a conversation about the journey through drug or alcohol abuse and where they are at now in their lives please meet sharon and kelsey hi guys hi. 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 <laughs> Yo. I want to call hug, too. My man that was on there. I'm happy to meet you, man. You Congratulations. Thanks to meet you. Thank you. So, Paul, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing oh, your welcome. story you're with you're us. Welcome. What's it like to sit here with him, guys? Mm. I mean, I'm kind of inspired. To imagine where you were and where you are is quite amazing for me as a mom, mm -hmm. because you think of every kid out there and all the struggles they're going through and he's doing it. Being from a gang for 20 years, drugs and, you know, and gangs, it, it, it's hand in hand. My thing was, I'll sell the drugs, but I'll never be an addict. Just finally crept up on you, right? Yeah. That and one prescription pill. That's all, it, that's all it took. I felt terrible, but I felt happy for you. So it, that uh, you've gotten to this point and things are good for you. I have a life beyond my wildest dreams today, you know? Right. And, it's, it's crazy to think about that guy that was in that park that night. Well, I cool. love that you're also open to talk about yeah. it. Yeah, part of what we do about just talking about our addictions is to address the stigma. Like, there right. is no shame in struggling. We brought you all together here to have an open conversation. But first, we're going to show you a video that was made by a high school student that won the 2018 Elks Drug Awareness Program High School Video Contest. And we want to get your thoughts on this video's impact. hold back to yours already. <laughs> you guys know what that feels like, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. No one starts off, you know, with this thought in their mind. Everyone starts with a with an open life that can go anywhere. I used to sing that to you when you were a baby. Uh, this is just, I, I'm like kind of emotional. Uh, my mom used to sing me this song. Oh dear, how much I, love I have that same dress. <laughs> She's growing up. Too fast. Because her is a teenager now. I was Such a good relationship. Mm -hmm. That's what it's like. You put on a brave face, you turn around, and just, everything's so heavy. She's changing, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's changing. Just holding something back. Uh, mom don't even, the mom don't even know what's going on. It's the parents need to be aware what their kids are doing. I'm on Jake on like 24-7. This is life, right? 
This, this, and I've been on both ends of these. I've snuck out of my house. I've done those things. I've been the parent. And then the mom starting to realize, catch on. Is that a, supposed to be a blunt or a sage stick? That is huge. Uh oh. Yes, she's waiting. That disappointment, mm -hmm. you know. I know. So I hope. Yeah, serious now. Uh oh. Uh oh. Now she's about to move on to a different drug now. Like, yo, let's get something else. Like, I know it's a dramatization, but like, that's reality. You right. know, like, I, they jump from she's smoking weed to yeah. she's freebasing heroin. Right. But it's all in the context of that boy. You mm -hmm. know, it's all in that context of her wanting to fit in and, and belong. Social and, pressure. Yeah. And make you happy. Yeah, right, Mom? Literally, it was for her first high, she was thrown up. Yeah. Sometimes they don't know how much they be taking. You go overdose real yeah. fast. Her friend just walked out on her. Yeah. She's lifting right to the floor. This is scary. You make me I'm frustrated and you know that's really not the answer. That's a parent's worst nightmare. It tears families apart. can't see her die, she has to live. That's so oh. scary. She's literally so young. Like, we're the same exact age. I just feel really like, guilty, I guess, about what my mom had to go through. Because, like, I was so oblivious that, like, my actions had any impact on anyone else. And we were just talking the other day, and she's like, you still don't recognize that what you do affects our family. It's just like a hard pill to swallow. When I saw that mom and then heard the loss, it's like it was our loss. It should not go, your child goes before you. For the rest of your life, you're gonna have a loss. You're never gonna be the same. My brother, my only sibling, we lost him a year and a half ago. He OD'd on fentanyl. I'm so glad to see him out of city here, but also it makes you think I will never see my brother again. You and your mom, I wish, I, I hope you guys will reach to each other because you need her and I'm sure she needs you just as much as you need her. I had the prettiest girlfriend when I was a teenager. We were very young. Getting high led her to jump off a bridge and kill herself as a young teenage girl. And I can imagine how the mother feels now that you've seen Madison's story and you have the chance to sit here and talk with her directly, can you start off by telling her how her story affected you today? Well, just hearing that the first time you tried it out was 12 years old, I think I was very shocked. It just made me feel for people that have gone through these tough times and like they feel like they can't talk to anybody about it and they have to revert to something else. I, I feel proud of you. And, you. and um, you know, I come from that kind of family, and, and I think you could be a representation of other people that it is possible, that you have to take it one day at a time. Hearing your story and being with you here today, mm. it's shown me like there's so many different ways to get to a certain point. We don't talk about it as a disease. I tell you I'm diagnosed with cancer, and you say, oh my gosh, right. let everybody rallies right. around. Right. You know, my mom's an alcoholic. Well, A, let's just start with we don't talk about it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but right. B, um, when it comes up, it's just everybody has this, comfortable. this veil of shame. So, Matthew, obviously we have Vivica and Don, who's her dad, here today. Can you tell us a little bit about how your drug abuse affected your relationship with your family? My family will worry a lot. I remember my mom telling me one time, like every time I hear a helicopter, I think about you. And that always stuck to me. As I was out there, like, man, I, 
I can't put no stress on my family. I used to be really close with my sisters. Um, I have three younger sisters. I'm not allowed to talk to them right now. It's like a missing piece of me, you know, like I really miss my family. Both of my sisters are like superheroes in my eyes. When things escalated quickly for me, they had to set really hard boundaries. And as a result, they didn't get to be my sisters. And I didn't get to be their brother for a really long time. Mm -hmm. Blocking my mom out. I mean, we're talking about a 10 year period. It has. I think scarred my relationship with my mom. It was real selfish of me, like, okay, yeah, I'm feeling good, but you know what, I'm getting hooked, and now my wife's gonna have to have a drug addict for a husband, and that's what got me to say, you know what, I gotta come forward and tell my wife, hey, look, I got a problem. According to the 2018 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, 16.9 million Americans aged 12 and older misused prescription psychotherapeutic drugs. Of this number, 9.9 .9 million misused prescription pain relievers. Mm -hmm. Talking about these issues with your parents or family members obviously plays a huge and important role in preventing the misuse of prescription drugs. So from your perspective for all of you, how do you think families should approach this conversation? I think as for teenagers especially, the more you tell them no, the more they want to do it. So I think you need to more educate them rather than telling them to not do it. Growing up, I'd open the medicine cabinet and like you don't think about it when you're when you're really young. I definitely had friends in high school who were like, what's in your parents' medicine cabinet? Is there anything good? The opiate epidemic is a serious thing because mm -hmm. popping pills, it's easy to get them now because you can get prescription for them. Your, your mom and dad might have them. Everybody has them nowadays. We've always been able to talk about it and it's never, uh never been something that was like taboo. Because I think that's the fear that some people have, is if you just don't talk about it, they won't know about it. From not being open, we learned years later, my daughter coming forward and saying, hey, you know those pills you had in the cabinet? I was taking them. I felt bad, like it, it was my fault. You know, that we didn't say, hey, look, these are dangerous. We didn't know how serious prescription drugs were because we came from the street where you just knew cocaine, meth, weed, you know, heroin, those are the, the big drugs. And you're really thinking that these drugs, because they come from a doctor, are, are not harmful. I've been in situations where there was definitely easy access. I guess I have always told you that yeah. I don't really think I ever want to try any of that. Honestly, it kind of comes from my dad seeing him and like his choice, like ever since I was born, he has like not touched a drink and I kind of admire that. It's best to be open and honest and have a, a chain of communication where you can trust that you're going to get an open and honest answer from your parents. So finally, to end this episode, what did you learn from talking to each other here today? I learned that as a mom, as a parent, we need to reach out to our kids. We need to know our, what our kids are doing. Parents um, gotta get involved in their kids' life and, and do activities. Take them out, go out for breakfast on the weekends or something, get to know each other. That people are struggling and there are people who are coming out of that struggle and thriving. Both you guys inspire and encourage me to forget my pride and you know what, so what about feeling ashamed of you know who you were or what you've been through? It's, it's better to be open. Oh, absolutely. And if it could spare one of my kids' life, why not? Like, I, I need to talk about it more. What I most learned is like, that my story can be impactful. At least it's helping somebody. Um, oh, yeah. I didn't struggle for no reason that I can, mm -hmm. I can use my voice today. I believe Ooh. there's a reason that I'm sitting here right now and that I have a responsibility to tell my story. Well, I think you're a pretty good spokesman for Sobriety Seriously? or uh, recovery. <laughs> Sad that it all happened to you, but now glad that you're, you know, moving forward and things are good for you. So yeah. hopefully that's the way it goes forever. When people are, are in that dark place and you're refusing that help, don't give up on them. Just kind of be there and let them know you're there. Whenever they're ready, you're there for them. I think I learned I need to be more forgiving to my family as well, right? Mm -hmm. I, I hold my mom accountable for a lot of things and I'm very angry at my brother, but based on your story, I think, you know, people deserve and, uh, uh, more chances. I like Paul. <laughs> I think Jackson likes Paul too. Hey guys, it's Sierra, producer here at FBE. Thank you so much for all those who shared their stories with us today. And a huge thank you to Elks and the DEA for partnering with us on this really important episode. For more information on this important issue, please check out the links down in the description below. Thanks so much for watching. Bye guys.